you can hear me over the ducting fans, which you probably can't, guess where I'm turning up today? One guess. Bet you will never guess that. Right then, people of the channel, we're going to be doing a fairly short and sweet one this time round. I'm going to be doing a qualitative, not a quantitative, analysis of some composites. Now, obviously, I teased you in that walk and talk in the forests episode about when I was talking about what the new design and build idea for an Arctic vehicle. Now, it's got to be made of something, and you're probably not going to be shocked to hear that I am in my huge great matrix of different sorts of pros and cons and different ideas and decision making. I'm going to come up with the idea that composites will be at the core of the design of the vehicle itself. I suppose there are other options. You could use wood, you could use aluminium, you could use stainless steel, uh, but really composites I think are where it's at when it comes to the best performance and the lowest weight. Weight is going to be a very major concern as it is on any sort of Arctic endeavour because anything that weighs something takes effort to move and we don't want to take more effort than we need to move something. Anyhow, I'm going to talk to you through a couple of minor uh, sort of mini experiments that I've done, a couple of A-B tests and just to show you how the sorts of composites that I'm looking to use behave. And so one example being uh, a few different sandwiches of carbon fibre and a negra and voiceover Alex will go into more details about exactly what sandwiches and what I was trying to work out. But here's one example. Uh, it flexes a bit, um, which is good news. And I'll be showing you why this is going to be at the core of one of my ideas that I'm hoping will end up becoming the main design itself. You can never be entirely sure though because you might prove yourself wrong and find out that something which you had no idea about might be much, much better, which is why you test. And also I'm going to be showing you how this larger sample gets on and I'm going to be seeing what sort of deflection we get with this one meter wide beam which is at a sandwich sort of recipe that I'm pretty sure is going to be quite close to the one I'm going to adopt just using the experience I've had before I knew this would be a good starting point it's super super lightweight and I'm hoping will be enormously stiff because stiffness for low weight is what we're after but also so is toughness and that's why I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what this sort of white frilly stuff is around the edge because that's clearly not carbon fiber so I will stop talking to you from my comfortable seated position and we'll get on with the test. This is a pretty good illustration of how when you sandwich different composites together, you get totally different properties. So here we've got the same amount of uh, Enegra and carbon mixed in. But on this one, we've got the Enegra on the outside with a carbon sandwiched in the middle. And in this one, the opposite. It's basically a carbon piece with a sort of a core of Enegra, if you like. So one of the inner laminates is Enegra. Now this, um, we'll do that. Incredibly flexible. Uh, you can hear the slightest noise of a few of the carbon uh, fibres starting to complain. This was woven carbon, by the way, not unidirectional, so, um, so it has strength in two directions. Um, they were zero and 90 degrees, not a sort of tracks in all weird, uh, weird directions. Anyway, <clears throat> what you end up with is a very, very flexible laminate which pings back into shape again. Um, but it, it lacks stiffness, and sometimes stiffness is what you want. This one, uh, as I said, same components but put together differently, is massively stiffer because you've got those carbon fibres on the outside almost fighting each other. The top and the bottom laminate are, um, are uh, in, uh, in disagreement, and so whilst one is trying to extend, uh, the other is trying to avoid being compressed. Uh, and so for that reason, you get the stiffness. Now, if I was enormously stronger and was able to snap this in half, which I, I, cannot, I cannot do, then this piece would not just fall into two halves. The, uh, the enegra in the middle would, um, would sort of hold the two sides together, and so you wouldn't get total catastrophic failure. There is some disagreement, and I've never seen it completely clarified online as to how enegra changes the characteristics of carbon like this. Um, I've heard some people say that the, uh, that the enegra actually heats up um, and dissipates some of the energy that way. I'm not sure whether that's the case, but it does uh, sound to me that if uh, a fibre is being stretched, then there may well be some energy transfer there from one uh, type to another. But um, I think it's probably more likely that you're loading up uh, one fibre, which is then meaning that the carbon, for instance, um, doesn't have to be loaded up in, a, in exactly the same way because of this. If this were just a standard plate of carbon, quite thin, uh, and you were to do this to it, it would start to fracture pretty, uh, pretty quickly. Um, but instead, the Enegra fibres are sort of saving the carbon, which is, uh, which is pretty cool. The Enegra itself is adding no stiffness at all to it. 
Here's a closer look at the one that's carbon, sandwiched between two thin Enegra layers. It's hard of course to work out exactly what is failing solely from the sound, but the end appearance can give a clue. Carbon fibres will break once elongated by 1 or 2% of their length. The epoxy resin will give up at about 6-8%, which is pretty flexible. The Enegra, however, can keep going to 10% or even a little more. So, in a tension test, they should fail in that order. If there's no evidence of cracks or flakes in the resin, we can assume that the partial failure is chiefly the carbon core. Eventually, we totally defeat the carbon and the resin, so we get a hard break. But the Enegra still holds the halves together until I force them to breaking point too. Once exposed as bare fibres and not within a matrix, the very low tensile strength of Enegra means I can snap the strands. Here's what's left at the clean break. The sandwich with the opposite recipe, with the Enegra at the core, behaves rather less dramatically. It's a lot stiffer, and I can't break it. I should do a version of this when it's very thin carbon on the outside, so I could eventually break it and show you what the Enegra manages compared to if it was just absent in a pure carbon sheet. I'm now proudly showing you some baking paper. Two reasons. The first is that I actually use this as a cheap release film when making test sheets like this. It's less wasteful than using nylon peel ply and smooths flat without bubbles more easily than plastic release film. But second, I've sandwiched a little of it between the leading edge of all the next test plates. This means I can wedge apart the two halves of the sheets and try and do a forced delamination to split them in half. This is useful. This is a pure carbon sheet and eventually I was able to get in between the two unbonded ends that the baking paper gave me, but I could not continue the laminar fracture any further. It's bonded too well, almost like a single entity. This is because similarly to much heavier glass fibre, the resin soaks fully into the fibres. This is one of the reasons why carbon fibre is such a high performance reinforcement for an epoxy based composite, and also why you can sand and drill it. Here we have the equivalent, using just a load of layers of Enegra. It's almost never the case that you'd make a laminate purely out of this material unless you really wanted flexibility and don't need much strength. Unless using a special flexible resin, you're almost always going to snap the resin before stretchy fabrics like this. Dialin is a cheaper option too, which is polyester, not super low density polypropylene like Enegra. The two halves come apart pretty easily. Granted, this sort of concerted effort to delaminate is unlikely in the real world, when flexing and point impacts are more common but I'm interested in a potential laminar weakness Enegra may introduce to an otherwise consolidated sheet made of carbon. A closer look shows that both halves are the same, with equal amounts of fractured resin on both. Since we now have the chance to flex a thin sheet to failure, here's a fold, hard in half. The resin has failed, as probably have some of the fibres on the outside of the bend, but plenty are still intact. Another well-known fibre is Kevlar, one of the brand names for aramid fibres. They are strong and stiff, but less so than carbon, and also a little stretchier, but nowhere near as stretchy as Enegra. It's often used woven into a hybrid with carbon, but as you can see, it shares another characteristic with Enegra in that the resin doesn't soak in. It just surrounds the fibres, meaning that you can separate plies with a concerted effort, and here again you can see them only coated in resin, still visually fibrous. Now to how different cores behave. It's common to use a core material to increase thickness and therefore stiffness, but without extra weight or cost. I've used carbon as the bread of the sandwich, and the filling, a very popular solid sheet of closed cell PVC foam. It comes in various thicknesses, doesn't soak up resin, and can be lightly heat distorted if you want to shape a curve into it. My intention here is to see if it's good enough for the epoxy to bond to without any surface preparation. Similarly to before, I want to know at this stage if a core material bonds poorly and so seeds a delamination. So, of course, since even a strong rigid foam isn't a match for this sort of force, it fails. But it's the mode of failure that I note and I'm impressed by. It fails at the centre of the foam. There's foam strongly bonded to both sides of the carbon. So, an excellent companion for the epoxy resin. Same sort of test, but this time with a hexagon stamped foam made of PET, which facilitates infusion resins, will therefore be heavier as it allows resin flow, but can drape and bend more easily. The failure felt the same as the PVC, and the epoxy bonds just as well. Good. This time a flexible fabric mat called Soric. This obviously follows contours better but is not closed cell, so will soak up heavy resin. I also used one side Kevlar, one side carbon here to see if there was a difference. Almost identical to the rigid foams, the epoxy bond was exceptional and the saturated fabric was a point of failure. Next, a natural option, balsa wood. This has compression strength far better than the foams, but is denser, albeit not compared to other woods of course. It will soak up a little resin, but not like an open cell foam or mat, and this impregnation may in fact help the bond. In this test, the result is rather familiar. The balsa failed, but this is not end grain balsa, which I couldn't find in this thickness. 
it may not have split into subsheets otherwise. You also have to factor in Bolsa's moisture content, which may have an implication in the cold where ice expands. We don't want cores expanding and buckling a laminate. As you can see from me continuing to bring forth wrath and disruption, this probably wasn't the best Bolsa for a fair test. My apologies are duly forwarded to the Bolsa Wood community. It also comes in lots of different density grays to balance weight and strength. I had some spare sections of all of these materials and was just curious more than anything else and so did some, let's call them open sandwiches. Sorek mapped on carbon here and I varied the amount of resin from a light surface coating to a full saturation. The fabric mat of course is again the weak link, but the hexagons that were solid and full of cured resin refused to budge from the carbon. In practice we can assume this core to have the strength and flexibility of pure resin. I did the same with two plies of Sorek and couldn't get them to delaminate. Sorek does come in different thicknesses but not very thick ones and I think that multiple layers could be a good candidate for complex shapes if we don't mind overly about extra weight. Honestly, these final two with the two sorts of rigid foam didn't add a lot to our accumulated wisdom of humanity. Since I only laminated two thirds of the fiber, I spent most of the time fighting with dry strands and we learned only that the board still bonds well to the carbon. When not bonded, they are brittle and snap away easily. Nothing to see here. On that note, we moved to the main event, a full size test. I noticed how enthusiastic you were about the artistic trolley introduction to the Temu episode, which by the way was the only episode on this channel to ever dip below a 97% likes to dislikes ratio, and it wasn't close. But not due to the trolleys, hence their reappearance now. I'm busy making a test rig, all fully health and safety approved and endorsed. Across the span, I place a 100cm by 20cm beam. I don't secure or bolt it down either end as I want to let it flex should it so desire, and we can assess its honest behaviour. The beam is a cord sandwich, unsurprisingly, a total of four layers of unidirectional 600 GSM carbon fibre, two layers on top and two on the bottom, then one layer of the same carbon but at 90 degrees so that the beam doesn't snap along its length. Finally, either side of a 10mm PVC foam core, a layer of 120 GSM Enegra. I've not cut the sides flush so the contents are easier to see. But at the cut ends, this gives you a sense of what we've made. The core is thick primarily for stiffness and should also be useful in terms of inherent buoyancy and thermal insulation. Now, I set up the slow motion camera setting and it totally defeats me as to how, as I walked away from the camera, the focus point shifted. I've never had this camera on autofocus, always manual. Anyhow, we can still see more or less what's happening and if you're more interested in the back wall, well, there it is for you. Upon placing all my weight on the middle of the span, we get a little flex. This is about 15 to 30 psi of pressure depending on how many feet I had down. Next, a little jiggle to see how it all springs back. The sound is mostly echoes from the corridor and slow frame rate, not despite what it sounds like a hyper-violent end of the universe as we know it. Then some more aggressive jumps and the beam is just fine. Finally, a higher jump. Failure of some sort, but I'm intrigued to know of what, given the prior tests and the known strength of unidirectional carbon fibre. Remember the narrow beams will resist these impacts much more weakly than a large sheet, say the 5 by 2 meter floor of a vehicle. At first it looks like a delamination of the core from one of the laminates, but as we look inside, you can see that the foam is actually still bonded to the Inagra carbon face. The foam has failed, but not neatly split down the middle. Another wind for the epoxy and the bonding surface of the foam. Let's have a look and uh, see what happens when we try and pull these two laminates apart now and see where the next bit of failure is. I suspect that this carbon is going to be very flexible. So it's now going down the middle of the foam. The, the core is absolutely the weakness here. But as you can see, this, this carbon is very flexible. That noise is coming from the foam, not from the carbon itself. The carbon is bringing perfectly back to shape again. There's no permanent uh, deflection going on there. Right, we're in two halves now. And let me just show you how this performs now. Try to work out what's, what's failing there. So that, I mean, that's a pretty, it's a reasonably tight radius. Let's 
force it back on itself. Okay, that's as far as it will go. But then um, that is still flat. So that carbon is still in great nick. That's probably going to be the cross plies of carbon that I was running longitudinally that way. Sorry, not longitudinally, uh, the transverse ones. So it goes to show that unidirectional carbon uh, really does um, spring back perfectly into shape, even when it's bent all the way back on itself like that. Although I showed you that in a previous uh, test. Um, uh, yeah, so here the foam is the limitation. That said, the point impact I was giving it there was, was pretty substantial. And there's also, in this sample, I haven't linked top to bottom uh, laminate. It's, it's simply laminate, core, laminate, and there's no way of actually holding those two laminates together. And I'm hoping that some kind of through core system I could try and invent, maybe like a slot I could cut through and then pass some, la some laminate that actually physically connects the two together with a fully resined up sort of uh, joiner. Uh, what, 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 what could we call it? Um, uh, we could call it like a, um, like, a like a tape or a tongue of laminate physically holding the two together so that they can't separate. Um, which would then not really get in the way of the, the cores functioning, but it would mean that it really does not want to come in two like it did there. Um, it would refuse to, I think, if you had one of those. Um, but you would, you would have thought that if I was doing lots of damage to these carbon fibers, that I would start to leave... Um, I'll do it that way so I don't get it out of my face. You would have thought you would start to get uh, a permanent deformation in the carbon, and I'm not here. Pretty impressive. That's pretty impressive. That is still. Still flat. Anyway, there we go. I noticed that the foam had cracks in it widthways. This means that as the beam was bending, the foam was failing in the orientation you'd expect any bristle, low to medium strength material to. Splits in a core actually don't matter so long as they stay bonded and they don't crush under compression. You commonly butt joint separate sheets of core materials together anyway. I also did a brief test on a thin sheet of PVC core foam, this time to see the behaviour of curing resin. I want to find out the window of time you have between the resin being too thin, so flowing and not sticky, and when it's only slightly tacky and nearly cured. The bit in the middle is when the resin is highly adhesive and helps keep new layers of fabric in place, ready to wet out and maintain a chemical bond throughout a part. It turns out you have about a half an hour at room temperature for a fast cure resin. The resin film stops the foam snapping quite so easily too, but back to real Alex. Now there will be 100% agreement across the audience that that was one of the most scintillating things ever committed to film. And I'm hoping that you'll be sticking around with us for the next episodes where we start to actually make stuff out of these sorts of things, as opposed to just making small sort of plates of them and trying to break them. Anyhow, cheers. Bye. No, 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 two more things. Cheers to my hosts at Vanguard, who you will not have noticed I plugged at the start. And of course, I return the trolleys to their racks like a true champion of community spirit. With that wholesome moment, bye.